Das Radikal. You know, if you were to ask Icelanders of my generation what was the most important election of our lifetime, most would probably say the election of 2009. Obviously, it came right at the heels of the financial crisis, the kitchenware protests were still going on at full swing, and the Independence Party suffered its worst electoral loss in all of its history, allowing for the Social Democrats to form the first true left-wing government that has ever resided in Iceland. However, in my mind, what is the most influential and important election in all of Icelandic history I'm gonna have to say that that was the election of 1901. Wait just a minute, Johan. Iceland didn't even have home rule until 1904. Well, you see, this election did not take place in the Icelandic parliament, the Althingi, no. This one was an election in the Danish Folketing, which is still the current parliament of Denmark. One thing you don't learn enough in school, in my opinion, here in Iceland, is the fact that Icelandic history and Danish history were very much interconnected, obviously. Now, most people are taught uh, when Iceland got home rule and maybe a little bit of how that was achieved, but the bigger picture is often neglected. And what I mean bigger picture is the fact that Iceland was, for a very long time, a part of a much larger country, which was the, the Kingdom of Denmark. And in this video we're going to talk about how the election in the Folk Tink of 1901 transformed Icelandic history, and of course Danish history, forever. First a little backstory. In 1863 Christian IX became the King of Denmark. He ruled over what is today Denmark proper, Schleswig and Holstein, which is today a part of Germany, the Faroe Islands, Iceland, Greenland and the Danish West Indies. In 1874 Christian IX visited Iceland. He was actually the first king of Iceland to ever visit the island. Icelanders were celebrating the millennial anniversary of Icelandic history because according to the Book of Landnáma uh, Ingólfur Arnason, the first settler of Iceland, had arrived in, uh, at Ingólfsöfði in southwest Iceland in 874. And in this visit to Iceland, uh, King Christian also granted Iceland its first constitution. It was a direct copy of the Danish constitution, however, a lot of Icelanders at the time saw this uh, uh, as, a fine, as a huge stepping stone for Iceland moving towards greater autonomy. However, that would not entirely be the case. While, while Denmark at the time had parliamentarianism, that is, they had a parliament that officially handled all state affairs and the king was uh, supposed to be just the de facto head of state, that was in practice not at all the case. You see, King Christian IX was extremely conservative and he tried uh, for his entire reign to haul in as much democratic reform as he possibly could. The way Christian IX was able to hold off any democratic reform was by simply appointing his lackeys to form uh, a cabinet whenever an election was held. In 1875, he appointed one Jacob B. S. Estrup to become Prime Minister. Jacob would re remain Prime Minister for 19 years, longer than any other Prime Minister in Denmark's history. In 1881, uh, Estrup and some of his lackeys formed a new political party, which they named Hörje. Hörje? Hörje? I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, most definitely not. But yeah, it simply means right, as in right wing. Hörje was most likely re created in response to another rising political party named Venstre, which was created in 1870. You'll never guess what Venstre stands for, unless you guess that it stands for left. Yeah, it's just like the word Vinstri in Icelandic. Uh, Venstre was uh, a liberal uh, agrarian party uh, uh, created to rep better represent the poor farmers that were trying to get greater autonomy from the rich landlords, many of whom were uh, 
royal lackeys, so to speak. From 1876 until well into the 20th century, uh, the political party Venstre got uh, a, a majority in the Danish parliament, defaulting in every single election. However, the king just kept uh, you know, you, uh, hiring his own lackeys, that is the people of Hörje and Estrup, to form a cabinet while ignoring the large majority of his parliament. So very little social reform happened in Denmark during this period and arguably even less social reform took for place in Iceland at the same time. Yeah, let's focus on Iceland now for a bit since this that is the channel's fo main focus. At this point in time the Minister of Justice for Denmark also had a side gig of being Minister of Icelandic Affairs. However, the Minister of Justice was obviously a Danish citizen living in Copenhagen and didn't really do much with his authority of being Minister of Iceland. So, in the 1890s in Iceland, much of the political discussion started to revolve around lobbying for an extra minister to the cabinet that would be only Minister of Iceland. However, the Icelandic political scene at the time was splintered between the followers of people like Valtir Guðmundsson, who wanted a minister of Iceland that would be seated in Denmark at the parliament there. However, then there were the nationalistic conservatives like uh, Björn Jónsson and the liberal reformists like Hannes Hafstedt that wanted a minister of Iceland that would be an Icelander, preferably seated in Reykjavik. The Valtiringa, as they were known, uh, argued that asking for a minister of Iceland seated in Iceland would be simply asking for too much of Denmark, and that it would be much more reasonable to ask for a spare minister, uh, which would only be a minister of Iceland, but would still reside in Denmark. There is also a very good chance that Valtir, who often lived in Copenhagen, was hoping to be appointed as said minister. So around the turn of the century, negotiations about getting a minister of Iceland appointed were well underway. However, this was still a huge topic of debate, that is, where said minister should reside. And then came the Danish parliament election of 1901. Not only did Venstre get a full majority in Parliament, but Hoyre, remember those were the conservative royalists, got lost in an absolute landslide, scoring only 8 out of the 114 Parliament seats. It was such a resounding defeat that even the conservative King Christian IX uh, could no longer in good conscience grant Hoyre the right to form a cabinet, so he allowed, for the first time, Venstre to take power. Uh, also, fun fact, Venstre, in case you're wondering, they are still around. They are, as far as I know, currently the largest uh, uh, party in the Parliament of Denmark right now, and I think they have been for months of history. But yeah, that's just a small side note. So with the election of 1901, one can truly say that parliamentarianism had taken place in Denmark. Never again would a king be able to dictate the government entirely at his own terms. And suddenly the reformists and conservative nationalists of Iceland were very much emboldened to ask for a minister of Iceland appointed that would reside in Reykjavik. And they were granted that risk. And uh, after some uh, further negotiations, Hannes Hafstedt was appointed to become the first minister of Iceland, and he took office on February 1st, 1904. And thus, the Home Rule era of Iceland had begun. And the tenure of Hannes Hafstedt as uh, minister of Iceland was actually marked with an incredible amount of social reform and social progress the likes of which had probably never been seen in Iceland up until that point. I could actually probably make a whole bit. What's that? Oh! It's a 650 page uh, life story of Hannes Hafstedt. Well, I guess I now know what the next video is gonna be about. 
So yeah, I'm announcing right now that uh, the next historic video is going to be about Hannes Hapstedt and his and uh, his time as minister, his life and his time as minister of Iceland. Actually, I can't promise that it's going to be like the next next video because I'm juggling more than one ideas at the same time. But I plan on making a video on Hannes. That's for sure. Anyway, thank you for watching and like and subscribe. Das Radikal.